Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols. However, you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says, Jesus is accursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except in the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another's gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. This is the Word of God. Thanks be to God. Now, we are going through this First Corinthians series. We're back to the First Corinthians, and then we're going to text by text, chapter by chapter. We came to chapter 12. Now here, the author Paul talks about the spiritual gifts from this text all the way to the chapter, end of the chapter 14. I know 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is very well known as a chapter of love. Love is patient, love is kind, love, love, love. But even that text is actually within the context of Paul talking about spiritual gifts, which you will see. This is a third issue that Paul addresses related to the corporate gathering, corporate worship within the Corinthian church. The first one was, if you remember, the issue of head covering in the church. The second was the Lord's Supper. And now here is the third issue, the exercise of the spiritual gifts within the church. And Paul begins this issue, this topic, in this way. Verse 1, he says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. And I want to say the same thing to you. I do not want you, hope of glory, to be uninformed or be ignorant of the spiritual gifts. I do not want you to have a wrong understandings or wrong expectations on the spiritual gifts because that often makes one to be prideful or, on the other end, to be really discouraged in comparison to other believers. Like, oh, I'm better. Oh, what's wrong with me? Or, people with the wrong understanding of the spiritual gifts, it can lead them to follow false teachers. All because of the lack of the right understanding of the spiritual gifts So. Before, Paul teaches us and gives instruction on the specific spiritual gifts. Here in this chapter, Paul lays down the general overarching governing principle of spiritual gifts in this chapter. These are much more important. These are what we Christians must keep in mind whenever we think of the spiritual gifts. And we must examine all the spiritual gifts and exercise according to these principles. So let's focus on the governing principle first before we discuss or look into the detail of what kind of spiritual gifts are there. Is this spiritual gift? Is that before we look into that? Or before we look into how all these spiritual gifts continue to exist today, even in our generation, or not? So-called, what is known as uh, the view of continuation is that we believe even the gift of tongue, gift of prophecy or healing, they continue to exist till this day with the Christian church. And the other view is called cessationism. It's like, no, especially the extraordinary spiritual gifts, they do not exist with the church. We will look into them in the future, the Lord willing. But today, I want to focus on 
the general overarching principle of spiritual gift that Paul addresses in this chapter. Because I do not have to address all of them on one day. So come back for that. Right? If you want to know, come back for that. So let's look into this. See the Paul's opening remark on the spiritual gifts. As he explains spiritual gifts, see where he goes first. Look at verse 2, would you? Look at the text. Look at the Bible. Open your Bible. Have the chapter 12 with you. Verse 2. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says, Jesus is accursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except in the Holy Spirit. Do you understand this? Paul just said, now I'm going to talk about the spiritual gift. Are you guys ready? And this is the first thing he talks about. What is the point he's making here? Number one, the Holy Spirit is the gift who leads us to the truth in the conviction. Holy Spirit is the gift who leads us to the truth with deep, genuine conviction. One thing that caught my attention is a repetition of you were led, you were led in verse 2. Twice it says you were led. Very similar word is used in the Greek here in order to emphasize it. When you were pagan, in other words, when you were unbelievers, you were led, it says, astray. In other words, to what direction? To the wrong direction, astray. To falsehood, to lies, to the false gods, the idols. You were led to the idols. That's what it says here. Here's the key. People in this world think, or at least they are not aware of the fact that they are being led. They think they are actively leading their own lives and thoughts, that they are pioneering their own path. Oh, no, nobody is leading me. I'm in charge of my life. I'm not being led by anything or anybody. No one is leading me. That's what they think. But Paul says here, no. When you were unbelievers, you were all led astray. You were led by who? The scripture tells us by the spirit of this world. Another name, the principality of the air. Another name, the father of lies. Another name, the devil. You were all led astray to the falsehood. All of them, whether they are aware of that or not, whether they acknowledge it or not, by the culture and the message of the world and through their own sinful desire and nature, they were all being led astray to lies, to falsehood, to false God. And we once were too. Paul says, when you were pagans, when you were unbelievers, yes, you were too. Now, that phrase implies this, but not anymore. When you were unbelievers, yes, implies not anymore. Then when we Christians believers are led by who then? Not by the spirit of the world, but by the spirit of God. You were born again by the Holy Spirit to the truth of Jesus Christ. And he led you to the truth of Jesus Christ to have faith in Christ. So Paul says in verse 3, No one speaks in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Pause. Now, some of you may think and some people can think, What? What is so hard to say Jesus is Lord that Paul says no one can say that except in the Holy Spirit? Come on. We can all say it. It's not that hard to verbalize those words, Jesus is Lord. Anybody can do that. What do you mean, Paul, that no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit? You can say it. I can say it. A child can say it. Anybody can say that. What does he mean? 
Now, Paul and the Corinthian church were living in the Roman Empire, Roman world. And one reason why Roman was so successful in conquesting all different regions and people groups and tribes and the cultures, one reason was because they accepted all deities. Wherever they conquered the people group there, without exclusivity, they accepted all their religions of their native people. In other words, they used religion as one of their tactics. Oh, we will accept your God, and we will give you Roman gods to you, and worship Roman God too. Now, that had a no problem, because in the ancient people's mind, they had a polytheistic view, which means there are many gods. Not only one God, there are many gods, God of this, God of that. And more God I have on my side, it is better for me. Nothing to lose. More gods, God of this water, God of this sun, God of the moon. God, oh, better for me. They will help me more. That's how they operate it. Using the religion. Now, when they conquered Judea, this little tiny area of Judea, the Jewish people, the God of the Jews had no images, no picture. We have no idea how it looked like. And no sacrifice was to be made outside of the Jerusalem, and they made Romans hard to assimilate. Especially because this Jewish religion basically invalidated all other religion, rejecting all other gods. However, the Romans did not crush the Judaism. They were treated with tolerance. Instead of worshiping the Roman gods and worshiping Roman emperors, Jews were required to pay the temple tax that other people, other regions, other tribes, other nations do not have to, but Jewish have, people have to pay the temple tax in order to show their allegiance as a sign and a symbol of their allegiance to Rome. Just pay that tax then, your temple, your religion tax. If the Judaism received such tolerance, there was no reason why Christianity should not also get the same level of tolerance, just like Judaism did under the Roman government. But Christian church faced a serious persecution in the Roman world. As I have said this before in this church, in the early church, Christians were forced to say this. Kaiser Curious, say it! Kaiser Curious, which means the Caesar is Lord. Caesar is Lord. Say it, or at least say this, curse Jesus. Jesus is accursed. Say it. But so many Christians, instead of saying that they confess, instead of Kaiser Curious, they said, Yes, is ho Curious, which means Jesus is the Lord. That was, I told you, that was like the very first creed, the confession of faith. Before we had the Apostles' Creed that we confess, the very foundational creed of the Christian faith was this one sentence, Jesus is the Lord. That's what we believe. They said this even risking their own lives and the lives of their children. Can you do that? If you don't say this, you will live. But if you say, Jesus is Lord, your child can die, your whole family. Now do you get it? That Paul says, no one can say, Jesus is Jesus is Lord, except in the Holy Spirit. That confession, even at such danger and risk and persecution, this is not about verbalizing these words. This is about the genuine faith and with deep conviction that no one can truly believe and confess in this way unless he or she, that person, is led by the Holy Spirit. Saying that, Jesus Christ, He is the Spirit of truth. Bringing the deep conviction and faith in that person. 
Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, helper, the Holy Spirit, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict. He'll bring what? Conviction into the world. Concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, verse 13, when the spirit of truth comes, Spirit of truth, He will guide you. In other words, He will lead you. You're being led by who? The Spirit of truth into the, all the truth because He will not speak His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak. He will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me. Who's He there? The Holy Spirit will glorify the Son, Jesus. Because he will take what is mine and declare to you, this is what the Holy Spirit does. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. He glorifies the Son. He turns our eyes and our ears and our attention to Jesus, to Jesus. Not to himself, to Jesus. He takes woo, whatever that is from the Jesus, the word of Jesus, and he gives to us. The spiritual gifts of the Holy Spirit has this one goal, function. Or I should say, purpose. To lead believers to Christ, to the head, in the truth. He leads us to Christ in the truth. He points us, not anything else, not you have a spiritual gift, or oh, prophecy, you will be go to this school. You will get this kind of life. Uh, not health, not prosperity, not wealth, or anything else. He points through the spiritual gifts to Christ. If God gives a gift of pastor to a church, the pastor is not to point to himself. A pastor is not the gift of pastor or teacher. It's not point to how to have a successful life or motivational speech. The gift of the teaching is not for how to be successful in your life. Dream, achieve your dream. It's not about that. It is pointing to Christ in the truth. All other spiritual gifts has this one aim, goal. Building up the body of Christ to Christ Jesus to know the truth that we may see the glorious reality of the Son, that we may love Him more, trust Him more, and be more like Him. When we were pagans, when you were unbelievers, you were led astray. But Paul is basically implying that. But now you are led by the Holy Spirit to who? To Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, let me say this. Holy Spirit is the gift that Christ gives to the church. When you come to faith in Christ, Peter says in Acts chapter 2, And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Did you see that? The focus is not you will receive gifts from the Holy Spirit. Oh, you can get all different kinds of gifts from the Holy Spirit. That is not the focus. You repent and come to Jesus in faith. If you do that, you will receive one, forgiveness of sin, and you will receive the gift. Who is the gift? What is this gift? Holy Spirit. Which He strengthens you, protects you, your faith. The work of the Holy Spirit through all spiritual gifts is bringing our attention to the Father and the Son. He glorifies the Father and the Son. Less attention to himself. But this is something what many charismatic churches are missing. They all wanted to focus on gifts, Holy Spirit experiencing that. Number two, the lordship of the Holy Spirit over the spiritual gifts. I just said it, the lordship. Something very obvious truth that I am sharing with you, the lordship. is a spiritual gift, Holy Spirit's gift, 
He is the Lord over the spiritual gift, the Lordship of the Holy Spirit. Would you look at verse 4 and on? Now let's look into this. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are variety of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them in all, in every one. Did you notice that? That we find the triune God involvement in the spiritual gift here? Verse 4, Holy Spirit. Verse 5, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 6, God the Father. Over the spiritual gifts, offices, activities, and services of, in the church ministry. Involvement of the triune God. Now, keep that in mind, what you just saw in verse 6. It is God the Father who empowers them all. But wait, wait, wait. Let's just go down a little bit more, just a few, few sentences later. Look at verse 11. In verse 6, Paul just says, it is God the Father who empowers them all. But verse 11, it says, all these are empowered by one and the same. Now this time what? Spirit. Who apportion to each one individually as he will. So now Paul says it is the Holy Spirit who empowers them all. Now in the book of Ephesians chapter 4, Paul, the author of Ephesians says, It is Jesus Christ who gives the varieties of gifts to the church and offices and services to the church. Who gives gifts to the church? Jesus Christ the Lord gives. He gives. But here in this chapter, clearly, verse 7 and verse 11, Paul again says, it is the Holy Spirit who gives all these different gifts to the church. What do we see here? So God empowers, Holy Spirit empowers. Jesus gives, the Holy Spirit gives. You know what we see here? We see the deity of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. As God, the Holy Spirit, in His divine will and wisdom, He, now hear me, sovereignly gives gifts to the church, to each individual, based on His will. That's what verse 11 says. Based on His will, as God, He is decisive. Of what you believe, what kind of spiritual gift you will have. He decides it. There is, this is not something, spiritual gift is not something you can get by practicing. It's not something you can get by human effort. Obviously, this is not something you can buy with large sum of money. This is not something you can earn by religious good works. Remember the story for those of you who are familiar with the book of Acts, Acts chapter 8? There was a man named Simon, a magician. He came and offered a huge large sum of money to Peter, saying, I'll give you money. Can I have that power, the gifts of the Holy Spirit? He tried to buy that with money. Remember what Peter said? Oh, Peter gave him the strong rebuke, this heart-melting, scary, trembling rebuke. How dare you think you can buy with money? Well, now, does that mean if the Holy Spirit gives based on His will, His wisdom to each individual, does that mean that we cannot ask for other spiritual gifts? Does that mean we cannot ask for more spiritual gifts? We can pray. Can we? Yes, we can. We can ask the Lord for others and more spiritual gifts. That's what Paul says in this chapter, the last verse. If you go to the last verse of this chapter, Paul says, you desire and pursue the higher gifts, higher ways. I know what that means what higher spiritual gifts are, and why they are higher, the Lord willing, I'll come to that next time. For all spiritual gifts has a purpose. For that purpose, there are higher gifts to accomplish that purpose. 
But at the end of the days, whether you will have this spiritual gift or not, whether you will have that spiritual gift or this, is solely based on the will of the Holy Spirit. He sovereignly gives, empowers, and manifests himself. Brothers, sisters, are you with me? All spiritual gifts are the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. That's what we just read. It is about the Lordship of the Holy Spirit. Empowered by, manifest by, He is in charge from the beginning to the end. For what purpose? Did you see that? For the common good. The spiritual gift is not only for that person who has a gift. It is not just for that person's self-experience. Spiritual gifts is given to all individuals for the common good, for the good of the church, to build up the church. So far, so good? Did you get what I just said? Now let me give you an example and see what you think about it. Because what I just said, you may think, that's all such basic stuff. But guess what? So many people are missing this. Bethel Church in California already. Big church. Famous church. Huge. They have a so-called supernatural school. All over the place now. I believe they have one here in Orange County too. A lot of people go there. Supernatural school. You get, you go there. Go through their school, you will get supernatural spiritual power. They got really famous and popular because of their music. They exercise their influence through that and especially on young people. Young people love battle music. In their supernatural school, they have this so-called prophecy class. And you can find a video related to this. It's not hard to find it. I saw a video, a lady who claimed to have a gift of the prophecy, teaching this class, claiming that if you take this class, that you can also have the gift of prophecy. Did you hear just what I just said? You take this class, you can also get the gift of prophecy. If you take this class and do what she tells you and practice them, then you can also have it. In other words, you can also be a New Testament prophet. I am not making this up. And sad thing is, many people do not sense anything wrong with that. Hundreds of people are attending that. And this is not only a unique case. Something like this is all over. In many places. But do you see how this contradicts what we just saw from our text, from Bible? You cannot earn it by practice, not by human efforts, not by following somebody's instructions in class. Spiritual gifts is not something you can get it like that. Why? Because all spiritual gifts are given by the sovereign will of the Holy Spirit. Spirit, for his purpose. Not only those extraordinary gifts, so-called the prophecy or healing or tongue and the utterance of the wisdom and soul, but even what is known as the ordinary spiritual gifts. People call the ordinary spiritual gifts such as the gift of help. Help, spiritual gifts. Gift of administration. You see that in the Bible. Is a spiritual gift. Gift of hospitality. That's a spiritual gift. Gift of giving. Generous giving is a spiritual gift. And all of them is not just simply your personality. And Bible says that's the work, manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Manifestation of the Holy Spirit, His work, His power through that believer, through that individual. You think that, oh, it's just a very, very hospitable person. No, it is the showing up. It is the work of the Holy Spirit. For the good of the church. For common good. That's what scripture says here. To build up the body of Christ. Again, look at verse 7. He gives gifts to all believers. 
All believers have them. That's what we see. Everyone, everyone, all believers, each and every believer. Are you a Christian? Are you a Christian? Then you have it too. No Christians are exception to this. He gives each believer one or more spiritual gifts for the purpose. Not only for your sake, for the sake of the body of Christ, to build up the body of Christ based on his wisdom and will for what this church hope of glory needs. And he gives each person spiritual gift for this. Say so our faith, our love, our trust in Christ and our conformity towards Jesus may grow and grow and mature and mature. For that purpose, you don't get a spiritual supernatural power by taking a class. You don't get a gift of tongue by saying hallelujah, 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 a thousand times very fast. That's ridiculous. You don't experience Holy Spirit by offering large sum of money. Of course. You say, of course. But did you notice? Watch some Christian TVs. Look at some ministries. And they say, Billy Jung Ministry, send us money. Give us offering. Invest with faith. Then we will send you this anointing oil. Anoint yourself with this oil. You will experience power of the Holy Spirit. You will experience healing. Anoint step. We will send you this, this holy water. We will do this. Give us money. We will do that. Or a pastor says, just say anything, just say anything, even if you feel like that it does not mean anything, even if you feel like gibberish, don't stop, just keep saying, oh yes, keep going, oh, keep doing it, keep it doing it, don't stop it, then you will get a gift of tongue. Practice it. The lady of the supernatural school of that prophecy class says this, believe, you got to have faith. Believe that you already have the gift of prophecy. And start to practice it from today. Prophesize it. Do it. Whatever that comes to your mind, if you think, quiet your soul, and whatever that comes to your mind, strong, say to other people, the Lord says to you, the Lord told me to tell you, he want you to do this. You may get wrong here and there at the beginning, but don't be discouraged. Don't let it stop you. Keep on doing it over time, then you will get better with the gift of prophecy. Is she serious? And hundreds and hundreds of people find anything wrong with that. They, yes, I believe. I already have gift. Do you know what we call a prophet who prophesies but proven to be false, not true? We have a name for that person, a false prophet. If one prophesies in the name of the Lord but found to be false, that the, he said, the Lord said, but actually found out to be that the Lord did not speak through that person. Yet the person abused the name of the Lord as if God said it. Putting those words in the mouth of God, even though God did not say it, but God said it and found to be false in the Old Testament time, that person was put to death. So many people, I mean so many people in America, in our days, to the point that it is scary, use this expression. The Lord told me. The Lord said to me. Oh, you can hear it. You turn to any Christian channels or anything. You hear this expression. The Lord said to me. The Lord told me to say to you. To share this with you. What do you mean by the Lord told you that? Often what they mean by that is there's this strong impression they have. The, the feeling they get in their mind. And I was like, how do you discern that it's not your own thought? How do you know? That is not your own inclination. How do you discern? So many wrong teachings are going around in the Christian circle related to the spiritual gifts. And do you know how they justify it? 
they love to say this, but I experience it. But I experience it. I feel it. And they elevate their experience above the scripture, the teaching of the Bible. And they are led by their own feelings and experiences. Oh, that makes us to go back to verse 2 and 3. You were led by who? By what? Did you notice the repetition of one and same, one and same spirit, one and same spirit in our text? Paul emphasized it. One and the same spirit, one and the same spirit. The one and the same spirit who wrote the scripture, the spirit of truth, who brought the word of Christ to us through the apostle and who gave us the truth here. He is the author of this book. And that one and same spirit is the one who gives the spiritual gifts. Who spiritual gifts is not just a thing, is a work and the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. The one and the same spirit does all kinds, different kinds of variety of gifts and offices and activities. There is no place of contradiction between the spiritual gifts and his truth. Oh, we don't see the Bible. That is not according to the Bible. Oh, it's okay. You guys are always just about Bible and the truth of God. Get over it. You don't live Christian life with your head. You got to feel it. You got to feel. Christian life is feeling God, feeling, experiencing God, this passion. Feel it. Oh, the Bible doesn't say it. It's okay. But we experience it. If the Lord wills, in the future, if I get a chance, if that is right, I want to show you a video. In the charismatic circle, what people call the slave by the Holy Spirit, the drunken, <laughs> I'm drunken by Holy Spirit. What do you act like? Oh, I'm drunken by the Holy Spirit. And falling and shaking, rolling, screaming, ah, uh, all that. And you, those kind of things that you watch. You can watch the exactly same thing in Kundalini in Hinduism. In pagan religion, they do the exactly same thing. I can put those videos next to each other, and you will not be able to distinguish. Is it by the Holy Spirit? Is it by what is it? And they claim, oh, but we experience. Can you step aside of the Bible? Experience it. Church, I'm done. Led by the Spirit of Truth, rejoice in the gospel that the Lord Jesus gave you the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth. He is with this church. He is with you, and He works in you so that you may build up the church of Jesus Christ to the head, Christ Jesus, that you may know Him in the truth, love Him, trust Him, and be more like Him. He used all spiritual gifts to each, every one of you to build all of us to the head, Christ Jesus. He's a spirit of truth. Be led by the truth. Let's pray. Thank you.